I will kick off. And I, um, Gemma, could I request you to turn your uh, camera on? Uh, Milan, the same for you. And Vidma, you can give me a green light. We're live, Arunabha, we can begin. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone, and good day to those of you who are in other parts of the world. I'm Arunabha Kosh. I'm the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. CEW is one of Asia's leading policy research institutions and ranked amongst the best climate think tanks in the world. Uh, we are delighted to be bringing this program to you, along with Carbon Tracker Initiative and my uh, co-author and colleague, Kingsmill Bond, who's an analyst at Carbon Tracker. Um, today is a very, very important session uh, for a few reasons. Number one, we are having this discussion right in the middle of a severe heat wave all across the world. Uh, while we are sweltering here in Delhi, uh, Siberian farmers are worried about losing their crops. Antarctica has recorded over 18 Celsius heating. Um, so we are not expecting a climate crisis. We are very much in the climate crisis. At the same time, uh, we are also in, um, in the middle of a pandemic that hasn't gone away, but because of which uh, governments across the world, economies across the world have suffered severely. And top of mind for any political leader uh, is questions about where new growth and investment will come from, where jobs will get created, uh, and how much more disruption can the general populace deal with? A third reason why we should be having this discussion is that we are bang in the middle of a consequential year. We began 2021 with a climate adaptation summit that the Netherlands hosted. Then in late uh, March, the United Kingdom hosted a net zero summit. A few weeks later, President Biden hosted a climate leaders summit on 22nd of April. And just a few weeks ago, the United Nations held the ministerial level dialogue of the UN high level dialogue on energy. The first time the UN is holding such an event in 40 years. Uh, of course, the head, head of government session will happen in uh, September. And soon after we will have the G20 meetings in October and the COP26 climate negotiations in November. So as we deal with a climate crisis, as we deal with a pandemic-induced recession, and as we deal with these consequential uh, events happening at a global level about how do we respond to a greener recovery and to uh, the overall energy transition that economies have to go through, our report on the potential emerging market leapfrog, what we call reach for the sun, becomes particularly important. And it's to discuss the findings of that research that CEW and Carbon Tracker have done, along with other partners in Ember, and to understand the political and policy nuances that uh, underlie any kind of policy decision with regards to the emerging uh, market leapfrog and energy transition that we've come here today for this program. I'm exactly at four minutes into this program, so I'm going to just take a minute more to formally welcome our stellar panelists who have joined us and from whom you will hear in a few minutes. We have Mr. Kalikesh Narayan Singh Deo, a, an Indian politician who represented his constituency of Bolangir uh, in Orisha and in the Indian parliament for 10 years. He initiated a detailed and comprehensive study of his constituency in, in, on developing a low carbon development roadmap, focusing on energy transitions. Um, Milan Koyev has over 15 years of experience, um, 10 years of which has been in the down and up midstream value chain in the solar industry. Um, Milan uh, is responsible for the development and overseeing of the construction of some of the world's largest solar power plants, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, where um, he's in, been involved in a 400 megawatt power project in Vietnam. Gemma Green is the co-founder and chairman. 
chairperson of Bar Ledger, a software that uses blockchain for energy and environmental commodity trading. After completing a business degree majoring in finance at Murdoch University in Perth, Gemma joined JP Morgan in London. She was involved with setting up the global environmental risk function at JP Morgan and then com completed further degrees at Cambridge. Uh, Xavier Garcia Casal is a senior expert in the energy transition at the policy unit of the International Renewable Energy Agency's Knowledge Policy and Finance Center. Xavier focuses on the transition uh, of the socioeconomic footprint analysis and bar system mark design work streams. With more than 30 years of uh, experience, he's been working on technical, economic, policy, social dimensions of the energy transition. So from this panel, you will hear about the technical, about the financial, about the business model changes, and of course, about the political and policy imperatives. But before that, I want to welcome uh, my dear colleague and uh, co-author on this uh, venture, Kingsmill Bond, who is the energy strategist at Carbon Tracker. He believes that the energy transition is the most important driver of financial markets and geopolitics in the modern era. He has, served, he has worked as a sell side equity, city equity analyst and a strategist for 25 years. He's written extensively on emerging markets and global themes. And I'm proud to have been able to partner with him on Reach for the Sun. Kingsville, over to you to present us the finals. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Arunabha. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to present today, um, set the scene for this very august panel. Uh, I will now share my screen and um, proceed with the presentation. So, um, well, as Arunabha says, it's, it's a great pleasure to have uh, written this piece with him, um, because of course we bring very different perspectives from Carbon Track and from CEW, and I hope that uh, adds to the strength of the report. The emerging markets uh, electricity leapfrog, to be clear, is an issue we have been debating for a long time. And, and it's one of the key issues of the entire energy transition. To be clear, without an emerging market leapfrog, there will be no energy transition. So today, um, there are four main parts to this brief presentation. First of all, I'm going to define the leapfrog um, and explain why it's all about growth. That's quite an important aspect of this uh, uh, analysis. Secondly, I'm going to set out why we are in fact much closer to the peak than most commentators realize. Then I shall take a very brief run through of the drivers of change and the barriers of change um, and conclude that the how the balance of forces is likely to play out. Clearly, this is an enormously complex issue and we're seeking to summarize um, a, a, a lot of work and I defer to many of the panelists and their experience, but nevertheless, I shall seek to summarize. And then finally, I'll take a look at how to speed up the leapfrog. So, to, to start with this very obvious point, but it is worth saying, um, leapfrog, leapfrogs are only about growth. Um, and, and I'm making this uh, very simple chart here. It shows how you can get from the non-OECD average of two and a half kilowatt hours per person to the European level of about six, uh, sorry, megawatt hours per person per annum to, um, in, in 30 years by getting all of the growth from new sources. and and. This is important because unlike in developed markets, it does not require necessarily existing capacity to be pushed out of the system. And as such, there will be much less resistance, we would suggest, from the incumbents. Um, the other different aspect of, about the emerging market uh, leapfrog is that emerging markets are engaging with this issue once the cost of the technology has already collapsed and once many intermittency solutions have been found. So in many ways, the leapfrog is easier than the pioneering and expensive work of Germany Denmark and others. And, and the leapfrog, of course, is something that we have seen in many other emerging market leapfrogs. So in telecoms and in internet, in banking, uh, again, I shan't dwell on them, you know them all well. It, it's just normal, of course, for the emerging markets to take the best, cheapest uh, local technology rather than the old one. Um, and there are, of course, many different leapfrogs. Um, we, we, we're not making the mistake of imagining it. everyone has to follow a simple uh, single template. So you can leapfrog to solar and wind from a low starting point like Nicaragua or Kenya. You can leapfrog as uh, 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 India and China have been doing. Uh, India from a uh, coal-based system with low levels of demand, China from a coal-based system with high levels of demand. You can be like Egypt or Argentina from a gas system, or indeed Brazil moving from a hydro-based system to solar and wind. But the point simply is there are different leapfrogs. Um, so why do we say 
in the second part of this presentation, why do we say that um, we're closer to the peak than people realize? Well, um, emerging markets are different to developed markets, but I'm quickly going to summarize the story in developed markets for you. Um, you have fossil fuels, nuclear hydro, biomass, and solar and wind. Those are the three different parts of the energy system. Um, and these are actually, this is actual data sourced from BP about how those have played out over the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years. And what you see is that actually fossil fuel demand in the emerging markets peaked 14 years ago in 2007. And since that moment, all of the growth has come from that light green line at the top, which is solar and wind. So the question really for the emerging markets is, will they take the same path that developed markets did a century ago, or will they do what they're actually doing today, which is deploying this stuff very, very rapidly? So the old solution or the new solution. Um, the second point then to make is that if you do that calculation uh, for the emerging markets um, X China, we'll come back onto China in a moment, but if you do EMX China, do the same three uh, buckets, you see that um, a similar pattern is playing out. Um, and, and actually, if you disaggregate the three drivers of growth, even in 2019, before COVID, you see that 49% um, of the growth already was coming from solar and wind, 38% from nuclear, hydro and biomass. And, and in fact, fossil fuels was down to 13% of the growth in supply. So we were already pre-COVID, very close actually, to an EMX China, uh, EMX China peak. Um, and you can do the same calculation in another way. You can look how each country reaches peak fossil fuel demand, peak or plateau, I should say, fossil fuel demand. Um, so in developed markets, it's been one country after another. 99% of developed markets now have reached peak fossil fuel demand. Do the same calculations for EMX X China, and it show, you see that 63% have already hit a peak or a plateau. It is, of course, possible, as Aaron Amber points out, that some of these peaks will be revisited uh, particularly in, in, in low supply, recently peaking countries, but the pattern is nevertheless unmistakable. And, and India, of course, is a very special case. I defer to the other speakers on this call and, and, and Aaron Abba, but to make a couple of observations in the global context, India, of course, famously has seen a double leapfrog, as you know. Electricity access has been brought to hundreds of millions at the same time as it has rapidly introduced renewable electricity supplies with very far-sighted policies. Um, and fossil fuel electricity fell not just in 2020, as one would expect, but also, in fact, interestingly, in 2019. So you see this type of picture of change over the whole world. Um, you're getting peaking demand for fossil fuel electricity in different time periods, as we illustrate here. So let me then move on to the third part of this presentation, which is looking then. So if we have established that we're actually quite close to a peak, and I could play with the maths, I'm not going to here, but I could play with the maths and demonstrate just how close we are, but nevertheless, um, let's look now at the forces driving change. We'll look at some of the barriers to change and then try and uh, draw some uh, conclusions about how that plays out over time. So um, data from BNF and others, let's start with economics, shows that for 90% of the world, renewable electricity is the cheapest source of electricity. And as costs are still falling quickly and as policy expertise is still widening, that's soon going to be 100%. Um, secondly, jobs. Renewables, in a word, means more jobs and it means local jobs. For, so for the 80% of the world that imports fossil fuels, it's an easy choice. You trade jobs for locals instead of rents paid to foreign oligarchs. Um, pollution, I need hardly remind you that millions sadly die from exposure to air pollution. The latest data from Vera suggests that seven out of the eight million deaths um, are occurring in the emerging markets. Then you have access, the absolutely core justice issue of access, uh, 770 million people without electricity access. Um, clearly, renewables are a better, cheaper solution to get access to these people that fossil fuels has not brought access to. And in fact, even in the IEA scenario, 84% of people lacking access, do they get it from uh, renewables? And finally, uh, energy security. Eight out of 10 people, as I say, live in countries that import their fossil fuels. So that's five drivers of change. There's a couple of other drivers we wanted to focus on specifically. Um, the first is the massive amount of renewable uh, uh, assets. So if you add up the solar and wind technical potential in every country in the world and you, you analyze it as a multiple of, of, of uh, total energy demand, you get this type of chart. Um, emerging markets have massive renewable resources. Their annual uh, renewable flow is 140 times larger than their energy demand. 
uh, also 140 times their fossil fuel production. So when people say to me, who are we to stop people utilizing their coal? Who are we also to stop people utilizing their sunshine? That's the point. Um, and in fact, you have some superpowers such as uh, Africa with 38% of the total and more than 1000 times uh, its demand. And then the other point is the industrial advantage that you gain um, or would gain if you built up local supply chains. Um, at the present, of course, it's China that's making a lot of the renewable energy equipment. However, politicians and industrialists are waking up to the threat and the opportunity. And we're seeing very quickly the rapid development of regional supply chains in India and Europe and the United States with, with news literally coming through every week on uh, that type of development. It's a necessary part of the transition. Um, global drivers also adding to these local drivers. Again, I shan't um, bore you too much with this. It's very well appreciated. You have carbon emissions, more of an issue uh, probably for DM than EM. But at the end of the day, a ton of carbon emissions is the same in, in Argentina as it is in Germany. Um, and it means, therefore, we should see more transfer of technology and policy. Although, again, as Aaron Eber points out, we're not seeing nearly enough. More needs to happen. Um, uh, same story in capital markets. Uh, my own background, cap, uh, investors don't like peaks. They're fleeing the uh, fossil fuel sector, reallocating capital into renewables. That drives change through the process known as reflexivity. And then thirdly, you have geostrategic competition between the United States and China, um, which, uh, which is basically the, the Chinese BRI versus the G73 uh, uh, B3W, which is likely to drive uh, change into the emerging markets as we've seen in previous geostrategic periods of competition. Now, um, I, I recognize I've only five minutes to go, but I'm still on time, Aaron, but fear not. Let me just quickly scoot over some of the barriers to change, which I'm sure this panel will talk about. Um, uh, so you have intermittency, you have capital size, cost of capital, policy, and vested interest. So to, to, to address those briefly, um, intermittency is often mentioned, but up to around 30% of electricity supply, uh, it's an issue which has solutions in the form of better policies and supply and demand side management, forecasting, and investment in grid infrastructure. And to be clear, Emerging Markets X China at 4% today. So there's a long way to the ceiling. And by the time you reach the ceiling, it will have risen. Secondly, capital is an issue, um, but it's not clear that the total costs of a fossil fuel-based system are higher than those of a renewables-based system. Um, and and when, it, when you refer to cost of capital, there is definitely a cost of capital issue, but you've got to think of the relative cost of capital of renewables versus fossil fuels, but definitely more needs to be done to solve that problem, to solve the issue of uh, local currency, um, local currency problems and, and uh, off taker risks and political risks and development banks, as we will conclude in a moment, need to be doing a lot more to solve that. Um, then you have policy. The policy is actually very well known and, and examined by people like Climate Scope or IRENA, amongst others. You introduce ma uh, markets, you uh, introduce auctions, you liberalize markets, improve regulations, and build infrastructure. It's very easy to say, but it's notable that countries that have implemented the right policies um, have retracted 16.5 times as much capital of those that have not implemented the right policies. And that then brings us, I would suggest, to the real barrier to change, which is vested interests, which we looked at a lot in the report. Um, but I would suggest that a good rule of thumb to figure out where they are strongest is to look at the 16% of markets, which are coal and gas exporters. So that was a quick scoot through the drivers and barriers to change. How do we think the balance of forces will play out well, in a nutshell, it's this type of chart, which is a bit of a concept chart, but as prices fall, you break initially through the technical barriers, you break then through the economics barriers, and then finally, right now, you start to break through the political uh, barriers, the political inertia, vested interest type barriers. And in India, of course, has been absolutely instrumental in enabling that to happen by launching the International Solar Alliance and by showing the way to other emerging markets. So you get this type, we would suggest, of phasing of change. If you take Rogers' diffusion of innovation theory and see this as a phase shift, you get um, innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority laggards. We can actually put each country into those buckets. You see the innovators such as Chile, the early adopters such as India, uh, China, famously the early majority, which takes you over the hump. And then you get late majority countries like Vietnam and laggards uh, like Nigeria, which face all kinds of vested interest type problems. Um, so this would then leave you with this type of framing for uh, how the emerging market story would look. You will see it's similar to what we started looking at in developed markets at the beginning, but different because there's growth. Um, but 
you see that you reach a plateau around 2018. You then are on that plateau for about five or 10 years, and then you fall off the cliff during the end of the 2020s. I should say, as promised, that China is a very similar story, but coming from a slightly different uh, perspective, sort of halfway between the two. So if I now conclude with how should we be speeding up change? Um, the local solutions we, we, we've we already touched upon, and frankly, uh, to a degree, people can copy what um, India has done, although every country, of course, is different. You liberalize markets, introduce auctions, improve regulation, build infrastructure. And it's notable that according to Climate Scope, 60% of emerging markets have not even put into place the basic policies to attract capital. Think about that. You just, we're a very, very long way from everywhere adopting the right local solutions. And then you have global solutions, which again, I will touch on briefly. You need to identify the right targets. Um, we would suggest there are three groups of countries, importers, exporters, and fragile states. They need different policies. Um, again, there's a very strong justice issue with the fragile states, which uh, we can dwell on in a moment. You need to stop financing fossil fuels, which finally is now starting to happen. You need to transfer technology and policy, where again, a lot more needs to be done. Um, you need to reduce the cost of renewable capital. Again, there are lots of ideas. Development banks need to be, we would suggest, more creative so as to drive down the cost of capital and attract in the private sector. Local capital markets need to be harnessed and so on. And then finally, um, there are certain countries which just can't do it. And you need to provide capital to help solve that access problem. So I think I remember I've stuck to time and I'm handing back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kingsville. You're bang on time. And uh, I will dive straight in into the panel since I've introduced our panelists. Um, let me come straight to you, Kalikesh. Uh, you are the political leader on, on this panel. So I'm going to ask you a, a straight up question. Why, when you were representing Bolangir, did you decide to look at what a low carbon development strategy could be like? And this, this was, of course, before this report came out. So now having heard what this report uh, is all about. Um, what what do you feel is, you know, why is this emerging market leapfrog to renewables, to a cleaner electricity system so significant? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Thank you for bringing this issue onto the fore. Given the pandemic in the last couple of years, we've actually forgotten about the issues of climate change and the kind of impact that it can potentially have, or is potentially having on climate and the economy and social, society at large. Uh, you know, I've always been passionate about uh, climate change and the environment. And ever since my early years, I actually, my, one of my first jobs was in a fossil fuel company. It was in Enron. And ever since then, and even when I was with Enron, we had started a, a small division for carbon, uh, uh, you know, carbon exchange and carbon trading. This is way back in the, before 2000. Mm. So that's when my interest was piqued on the issue. And I followed the subject. I've been passionate about it. I've been legislating on it. I've participated in, you know, in, in a in a in a, uh, a peer group of MPs who actually lobbied with the central government to increase the budget for renewable energies many folds, and uh, it, it's it's double, triple, quadruple since then. So I've been involved in the subject uh, ever since then. Uh, you know, I started off with the with the report on Balangir on a low carbon development framework. Uh, because I, I thought that I could possibly lead by example of how an individual MP can actually think about these issues and translate it, it into action on the ground at a very micro level. Mm -hmm. When we talk about uh, carbon change, uh, carbon exchange, uh, sorry, climate change and ca carbon renewable uh, energy policies, etc., we look, normally look at it from a very macro level. Mm -hmm. And that's probably correct. That's, that's the way to look at it because you can, you can have a major impact on, uh, by macro policies on, on the subject. But until it is picked up as an issue by the local villager, by small villages in hinterland of India, the issue will never be politically strong enough to find mainstream uh, voices. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that there's a pressure of both the, the Indian, Indian uh, think tanks and policymakers who were involved on the subject, as well as the uh, international movement on climate change, that this, this issue was brought into the forefront of the Indian government. And India had, had, had initially did do a lot to kickstart uh, you know, uh, renewable energy uh, in, the, in the development framework. Let's not forget that we have an age old uh, uh, lo lobby group of fossil fuel in India. 
it's a very strong lobby group of coal of of oil oil importers uh, you know they not only work provide jobs they not only have a huge influence on the economy in states like mine uh, such as orissa and mining is a is a major economic factor but they also have a lot of uh, vested interest groups uh, funding into political parties and you can now that some of it is coming out in the forefront you can probably see links between uh, major uh, you know uh, coal traders or coal or coal miners or coal mine developers and uh, governments across cutting across party lines so you i mean to kick start this whole uh, revolution you needed to have a lot of a uh, lot of push a lot of awareness and a lot of a lot of muscle even in the parliamentary framework so that was the reason i actually started off on the subject and i hope to continue with this uh, with with my efforts on climate change in the future too thanks kalikesh that's that's really candid of you to kind of lay out the political economy so clearly i will come back to you in a few minutes uh, before you have to drop off but let me come to you milan uh, you been operating a lot in southeast asia uh I, you know working on renewable energy projects as the ceo of hexcon peak do you uh, do you see a similar political economy playing out in the way that uh kalikesh narrated for india or for you know basically that there are these entrenched interests um that that have this uh, uh have, have the interest in continuing with either the import or the export of fossil fuels so how does how does that political economy play out as you're trying to deploy uh, renewable energy projects in the region um thanks uh thanks anurva um i think uh, we, governments is uh uh governments is one issue but uh, private sector is uh, is where the biggest drive comes uh and the clear example is that we have multiple countries around the world where uh renewables and uh you know clean energy picks up without any government support mm -hmm. uh i can give a few examples but uh i'm based in singapore and singapore is a, a piece of land smaller than your neighborhood uh and um, it has uh, much more solar energy per capita than uh um any other country in uh, in southeast asia um so it's uh, <clears throat> it's a, it's a topic that uh, it's a, it's always the chicken and egg um governments have uh, enabled um uh, industries to pick up but they also have destroyed them in the past um governments are in some countries uh, particularly in uh, in asia in, in southeast asia in some countries governments are still supporting um, coal a uh, particular example is indonesia where we still have uh, the, the the state utility company still receives uh, subsidies uh, still gives subsidies to coal producers to keep their plants running uh we have banks we have private banks that are still lending money for uh, uh you know coal power plants and fossil fuels um so until this stops um i think uh there is not going to be any uh, significant major drive for the private sector to pick up and really uh, uh emerge um what we have seen in india was uh, uh, let's put this straight uh, what we have seen in india is amazing uh, india was uh, the biggest uh, solar market for one of the biggest solar markets in the world for many years uh, however uh the biggest drive for the industry to pick up was uh, profit it was not saving the world don't let's 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 put this straight um it was not driven by the carbon carbon uh, emissions uh, offset target okay it was mostly driven by profits uh the governments have enabled those with regulations and subsidies that they uh, uh imp imposed um however the private sector picked up the industry based on purely based on profits uh banks got involved because they've seen that they can make interest rates uh and the whole industry picked up based on profit profitability so but that's fine that's totally fine uh we need to set the governments need to set the framework for for this to happen and uh it, there is no right now uh, particularly in our industry there is no conversation whether conventional uh, power uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, coal 
or renewables, uh, particularly solar, there is no conversation anymore. Uh, it's clear that uh, solar is competitive on uh, cost level uh, to uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a report came out which stated that operational coal power plants are more expensive than new solar added. So with that mathematics, there is no conversation anymore. It's exactly the same, like there is no conversation whether uh, there is climate change or not. Uh, it's like arguing whether the planet is flat or, 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 or not. So it's, it's simple. Uh, it's very simple uh, and uh, it's going in the right direction. Melan, thank you. Uh, Kalikesh, in the interest of, you know, getting your voice in as much as we can before you drop off, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, Milan says it's simple, but uh, you know it is not, you know. <laughs> so, and that's why what Kingsmill and I focused on in the report is more about the leapfrog being about growth, that every new capacity that comes in will be about renewables. But you're still left with this legacy issue. And as Milan described, you know, so many emerging markets have these unreformed power markets, unreformed electricity markets. What, in your opinion, is a politically salient way to reform this without you know, <laughs> losing your seat in government? <laughs> no, actually, I would think that if you reform your power market, especially on the distribution side, you would have, you would see huge gains. You know, uh, Odisha was one of the first states to actually uh, to, uh, to privatize its distribution sector mm -hmm. and, and including the generation sector. Mm -hmm. But uh, Unfortunately, what happened at that point of time was that uh, you, you had these distribution networks privatized, but distribution was packaged along with marketing. So you still had a uh, monopoly on that certain sector. So it didn't matter whether it was a private sector company rolling out the services or it was the government rolling out the services. They did what was in their best interest and there was no competition. Now in mm -hmm. today's day and age, if you actually just, uh, privatize distribution and allow the distribution companies to source Energy, energy from different sources, including renewable. I, I would think that you would have a lot more competition in terms of prices. And as I think Milan was saying that, you know, the prices are clear, the, the verdict is clear. So solar will any day beat coal. Mm -hmm. I'm still concerned about the level of uh, subsidies that the government in India still gives to the fossil fuel sector. You know, there are, there are subsidies which are overt and there are subsidies which are subvert. I mean, there, there's, there's a lack of uh, taxation of, of uh, carbon emissions, which is there. If you put that one tax on the entire carbon sector, you will find that solar, solar renewable just becomes that much more uh, profitable and viable. And of course, all private companies will go into it for profitability. They're not going to go into it for social, uh, for social needs. Uh, money will change where money can be made. It's up to the government to set up a uh, viable framework to encourage that. And that's where you, you have sensible policies coming in, which India did begin with. I, I feel they could still carry on with a little bit of that even in the years to come. Uh, uh, number two, I think uh, energy is always going to be a very highly politically divisive subject, the de debate of privatization of energy. You know, it, uh, I see it in my constituency. You know, people want electricity. They want access to stable electricity. When it comes to paying for it, sometimes they think that they can get away without paying for it or not paying the complete costs. I think this whole... Uh, uh, issue of uh, you know energy efficiency has to be brought in, in the issue of actually being able to pay and the willingness to pay for the quality of energy that you actually get and the decentralization of energy uh, energy sources or energy generation sources have to be put into a more comprehensive policy package i think it started off is still ad hoc there are elements coming in every now and then but we haven't seen a clear line of thought between the central government and the state government because there is a complete disconnect on the way the state governments view distribution of energy, which is seen as a quasi-social, uh, uh, you know, uh, freebie given to the to the to the to the to the villagers, versus how the central government would like to see it, which is a more economic uh, macro reform area. But of course, Odisha also experimented with the distribution franchise model, uh, which now many others have tried to examine and see if that can be applied elsewhere as well. Um, we hope to hold on to you a few more minutes, Kalikesh. So let me first get in, uh, Gemma, and sure. here on one, one issue. Uh, you know, uh, Gemma, Zavio, everything that Kalikesh and Milan have been saying is that, look, the cost economics is making sense. 
uh, if you frame it rightly, then even politically you can sell the sell the reform. Uh, but at the same time, when you examine, you know, emerging market by emerging market, there's still challenges of infrastructure, building out the infrastructure, the the financial ecosystem that can direct money into these new projects. Um, so, what do you think are the ways to smoothen this transition, even if it sounds so evident? Um, maybe I'll go with Chema first, and then Xavier, you have 30 years of wisdom to bring to the table on this. Gemma. Well, I mean, if you look at the countries that have high penetration of variable renewables, um, it often comes with a higher overall cost of electricity in the system. And that's not just derived from subsidies given to the renewable sector. It's because of very blunt price signals um, to build renewable energy, not where it's needed and not when it's needed. And as a result of that, um, there can be higher costs in terms of um, uh, transmission lines and distribution lines and also grid stabilisation services. And so I think part of the leapfrogging story needs to look at more dynamic price signals to the market to build mm -hmm. renewables when and where they're needed so you're not ending up in a situation where, you know, you've got very high penetration of renewables, say Germany, 53%, but very high carbon very high um, energy costs and actually not that stable. Um, so I, I think with India, you know, it's done a fantastic job at growing large scale renewables, but the, the distributed renewable piece um, is where, you know, there's a real opportunity. And um, Power Ledger is working with the state of Uttar Pradesh. They've um, changed some of their regulations to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity as a way to drive the uptake of uh, rooftop solar in both businesses and households to scale distributed renewables without the need for as much subsidy and also using dynamic pricing so that you're not, you know, growing a lot of renewables in a system that can't, you know, that isn't able to handle that. And as a result, having to do expensive grid upgrades around substations, transformers, and, you know, creating issues with voltage and reactive power. So, uh, like we're doing a peer-to-peer -peer project with Tata Power in Delhi, uh, which we're really excited about. Um, they're, they're looking at, you know, how do we encourage more renewables in the system, uh, you know, that, you know, is not just large scale. And Karnataka is also looking at um, similar interventions. And we're working with the India Smart Grid Forum and WWF. So I'm really like super impressed with what is happening in terms of trying to change the direct trajectory around distributed renewables in India. But if it just copies what like some of the high income OECD countries have done, I think it will end up with a system that is higher cost and it doesn't have to be that way. It is possible to, as you know, you've pointed out Kingsmill leapfrog to a system that is highly resilient, low cost and, and low carbon. Zavia? Um, Gemma, of course, has talked a lot about the distributed energy side of it, but uh, whether it's distributed or grid connected renewables, what can be done to smoothen that transition? Well, there are many things that can be done, but I would like to start perhaps on trying to reframe a bit our mental approach to the issue, because I, I hear a lot on the comments and I agree with all of them, eh? but the only thing is I have the impression they only look at part of the of the issue and not an holistic picture. No, I mean, all this drive for privatization, I mean, if I would, have, if I would have a wish about where would be having to be leapfrogging, it would be on these conceptual frameworks. So it's the technological part, it's gonna advance on its own. I mean, costs are going down, but costs, reduction it's not the ultimate goal that we are having and you are experiencing it already in, in india so i mean you are losing social value by mitigating prices and trying to push for prices too low and this can trigger problems and problems of acceptance of the transition itself i think the true challenge in the in the leapfrog approach is on the other dimensions in the socioeconomic and in the poly in the policy dimensions that is where we should be trying to put together a scheme that works for the kind of system we want to transition to. And another small note here, perhaps then we have more time to go on it. 
But the system we want to transition to, it's the whole energy system, not the power system. The power system is the easy part. And the marginal or the incremental part of the power system, it's still easier. But the power system should be the angular, the cornerstone for transitioning the rest of the energy system through integration. And that is where we have the real challenges. If we don't look at it from the beginning, I mean, now in India, you have 10% of renewables contributing to total final or total primary energy consumption. It's the 90% the challenge we have. And the framework for addressing it for climate change, I mean, you mentioned before, and Kalikesh also that we are already within climate change, so it's not something for the future. I mean, there is a lot of noise around it. We, are, we have some boundary conditions, like it's the carbon budgets that we have available for a certain level of temperature, but all or most of the scenarios we have on the table currently, they are still speaking about emitting 600 gigatons of CO2 more. If you go to the original carbon budget we have and you update it to 2021 and you take into account the earth system feedbacks that are there and you take into account the updates and measurements, what we have left is something like 250 gigatons. This is six years of emissions at 2019. So it's, I mean, it's something extremely challenging, the transition we are trying to, to push forward. And this requires to, to foster a collaborative framework and to address many things. Among them, the organizational structures. So power systems as we have working now, they are unfit for a system based on renewables. You can easily navigate them until you reach 30%, 25% of introduction of renewables but they are unfit for managing a system that is working based only on renewables. And they are unfit for triggering the kind of flexibility needed for supporting this system. And unless we address this layer of the transition, which is changing the organizational structures, in the specific case of the power system, power markets or power uh, organizational structures in regulated systems, we are very far away from any option of evolving towards the kind of system in the time frames we are speaking, which are, so it's, it's like advancing in a pathway without caring about whether the pathway goes further few meters ahead of us. I mean, we can find a cliff down there and then we don't have an, any maneuver to, to, to move beyond this cliff. I mean, and, and in this context, and, and this is in fact what I wanted to say from the beginning, but I moved to other things, sorry for it. But in this context, I think we really need to widen a bit how we address the issue and not focusing so much in liberalized approaches, which are the, 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 the legacy we have from the global north, which are working properly for some things, but are facing many challenges in other ones. And they are facing many challenges for the transition. And there is a big role that could be done by the public sector in directing this transition more efficiently or at least as, as efficiently as with a liberalization pathway. And the point in my head at least is that each region in the world has a, a policy framework, a socioeconomic framework that it's more fit for advancing the transition with one tool or the other one. And both tools, which is public ownership or liberalization, both of them, they are imperfect as of today, but basically what they are missing, it's a lack of governance. Both of them, they work against the social value that we need from the process. Also private sector, I mean, we are in this process because of how profits have driven the evolution of our socioeconomic systems astray from our social interest. And the same happened with public, but the right mixture of both offers much more potential. And I think that is where we have a real leapfrog opportunity if we open our minds. That's, that's very well made the point, and I want to explore that a little bit more um, later in this conversation. But Kalikesh, before you go, let me take off from where Xavier left off and ask you um, a, 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 this more broad overarching question. But it, as we presented in the report, India is going through a double leapfrog. You know, one is just connecting households with Dexby for the first time, and also going through a massive deployment of renewables. Now, uh, in a way, three questions come to my mind for you. One is, what happened um, uh, to the, you know, the impunity with which at least some political leaders you know, promised this free power? Now, even when you're a household that's getting connected to power for the first time, whether that power is coal-based or renewables, 
you're getting your representative to tell you that this power is free. So how do you make that switch happen? The second is, what do you do with the legacy assets? So even if every new asset is going to be renewable, what, what is the transition, uh, politically salient way of transitioning or decommissioning the thermal assets? And the third question, especially in say states like yours, where, you know, again, CWS work in Delhi and Bihar, uh, in parts in Orissa as well, where we see a lot of opportunity for distributed energy, the kind of stuff that Gemma was talking about. That's far more employment intensive. It can drive rural livelihoods. So is there a different political narrative rather than public versus private that this energy transition can also drive livelihoods and bring it closer to people? So I'm sorry for giving you this kind of meta question, but you're the one who's on the ground. So who else do better to respond than you? No, absolutely, Arunav. Uh, you know, uh, the first question, I mean, political leaders will promise anything to get votes. Let's be clear about that, you know. But uh, the communication of, of think tanks, of the media, of society at large should be that if you promise something, you got to, the whichever pol uh, political party promises something as a freebie in government, is got to pay for it one way or the other. And the payment comes from a finite budget. So the, if the communication which go goes to the voter that look, they may be giving you 500 rupees worth of free electricity, but they're not going to give you that, that much healthcare or education or something as an alternative, mm -hmm. then, they, then we leave it to the voters to, to choose, uh, make the choice correctly. The problem is that that particular campaign of uh, countering the freebie with correct uh, thematics doesn't really always go down to the voters. And that's why they tend to get carried away. What I've also found now is also that uh, many parts of uh, rural India and, and rural Orissa are also keen to get stable electricity, which they're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. They will try and get it free if you allow them to get, you know, to nudge you and push you in that manner. But if, if the government stand firm and privatization becomes one element of that because it's easier for the private company to say, no, I will take full money from you or I will take 50% of the money from you before I repair your connections or repair the village connections, you know, then payment gets that much easier. And that's where I think privatization of distribution companies will play a reasonably large role in ensuring that the, the, the payment collection of the, which, is, which I believe to be one of the major problems of the economics of uh, power distribution or power generation in India will, will so, sort of come through. Uh, Gemma is absolutely right. I mean, you know, there are many villages and areas which have been very far flung and the government in its zeal to announce that 100% of India is getting electricity and gets connected, did not actually do the cost benefit analysis and insisted on, you know, running these massive uh, transmission lines across forests, across large areas to connect two villages in the middle of the mountain somewhere. I mean, these are these were low hanging fruits that we missed out upon on. We can still we can still correct that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a technical person. I don't know the details of the cost benefit analysis. But even now, if you if you convert these areas into, you know, uh, small grid, uh, small grids, uh, based on renewables, even now you'd be able to save money on transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And even your know, TND losses, I mean, let's not forget we have 30 to 40% TND losses in most states in India. That's a huge, huge uh, impact on both economics and the, cli and the climate. Uh, what's going what's gonna to change the entire sector? Uh, <laughs> you know, I again, I come back to what I initially first said, a lot more uh, conscious, uh, you know, informed policies and a lot more accountability of uh, independent bodies, which can actually come up with, uh, you know, carbon budgets for various states or sectors and can implement and find those sectors if they exceed that, uh, have a nice, uh, have a robust carbon trading mechanism in India. Incidentally, that was a bill I actually put up when, when I was in parliament in India to have a climate change and carbon trading mechanism and a carbon budgeting system for various industries and states. But, uh, Unless we have a comprehensive view of how, how the sector is going to evolve, it's going to be ad hoc, it's going to be based on profits, it's going to be based on where the private sector reaches and in those large uh, you know, areas. Uh, what's happened now is that the, most state governments have stopped giving subsidies for uh, uh, rooftop solar, you know, something which was working really well when you had uh, a robust subsidy system. Now, 
what I don't understand is if you can give a massive coal mine subsidies, why can't you allow small villagers to put up little little solar panels on their on their rooftops? I mean, that's basic to me. It doesn't cost that much. You know, it gets easily absorbed in the system. So I, uh, you know, many more talks such as this one that we're having. Hopefully, much more conversation around it. We'll reach the we'll reach the correct uh, correct years, and hopefully, India will develop a system which which works comprehensively and uh, addresses the issue. Thank you, Kalikesh, for all your time today. I know you have to drop off for an important engagement, but before you go, let me also, since you come from Odisha, let me wish you a happy Ratyatra. Uh, for those <laughs> of you who don't know, it's a very, very, it is the most important festival uh, in Odisha, the, the, the procession of the chariot. And I, I, Kalikesh, just as I was mentioning, the UN High Level Dialogue on Energy, we brought out an e-book on India's energy transition, and we used the... Uh, uh, Sun Temple of Monarchs theme motive as, mm -hmm. uh, as one of the ways to demonstrate India connecting between the past and the future. But again, thanks so much for uh, shedding your light on a very, very complex issue, but uh, with extreme candor, which we really appreciate. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you and happy to have to all of you. Bye-bye. Namaste. Namaste. Um, Milan, let me come to you. Um, this issue of, you know, where there's distributed energy, uh, and I'm hoping you're still there, I and mean, I know you can't turn on your video uh, right now. Um, this issue of uh, distributed energy, of this choice uh, of, you know, subsidizing uh, coal versus, uh, you know, rooftop, uh, the opportunity in uh, creating a lot more jobs, uh, using a different power system, uh, at CW, we call this the trinity of jobs, growth, and sustainability. How do, have you seen this play out as a narrative in other emerging economies that you've been working with? Um, that it's not just a climate change narrative, it's a very different narrative to, to convince or bring the people along in this energy transition. If you can hear me, over to you, Milan. Your, uh, we can't hear you. Your microphone is not muted, but we can't hear you right now for some reason. But actually, jobs, uh, jobs has never been a drive for uh, governments to to um, to create uh, those uh, micro industries. Um, the, the problem is that uh, the the renewable energy uh, sector is uh, geographically very dense. Uh, we have a couple of uh, big markets, but all the rest is uh, really spread around the world in very small uh, volumes. Uh, basically, the gigawatt markets uh, are not more than 10, uh, particularly for solar. Uh, but I would suppose wind is similar. Uh, and so, in order to in order to have a, <clears throat> in order to have a, such a microeconomy long term, uh, you really need a you really need a long term policy, which is something we don't have. Uh, there is nowhere in the world where the carbon emissions are anyhow uh, the targets for carbon emissions are anyhow connected to the policies for renewables. Uh, in terms of uh, you know. Uh, Reaching the target, this is the this is the subsidy at twenty percent. This is the subsidy at fifty percent. This is the subsidy at one hundred percent. There is no long term forecasting for for our uh, industry, which is uh, I think the major problem for this to be a sustainable economy, micro economy. And from that perspective, those jobs are not sustainable uh, in most of the case in most of the places. Uh, there are there were a lot of markets around the world where. We had explosive uh, growth uh, for a couple of years, and uh, later on it uh, it shrank back to zero. Uh, just to give you a few examples, Eastern Europe was becoming huge in uh, early 2000. Uh, Asia, uh, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, all those countries were uh, exploding and then uh, disappearing. Uh, more like a solar nova kind of thing.
Thank you. Um, thank you. Let, let me, before I again come back to Gemma and Xavier, uh, let me bring in uh, some of our uh, questions, some of the questions we've got from the audience. Um, and let me go straight into this issue that Xavier touched upon because Luis uh, Fazendero has said that, you know, echoing uh, Xavier's intervention, I believe that the profit incentive and market signals are nowhere sophisticated enough in terms of farsightedness to be compatible with a less than two degrees world. So um, if a government, if a company must report to its shareholders uh, or national governments every quarter to report policy, uh, profits, there is no way it can implement policies and interventions and investments that assure that two degrees Celsius is not breached. Um, so, I, I, and Xavier earlier had talked about that it's not public versus private, it's actually how you frame the, this reform process. Uh, maybe I'll come to you, Kingsmill. Um, do, do you have a, I, of course, in our, in our report, we've not suggested that, you know, private, private is the only way to go. We've only talked about better policies. But uh, do you have a view on, on this broader discussion we've been having on is it public versus private or is it actually a completely different way of packaging uh, the reforms that are needed? So, so I think um, the, the first point we all have to realize or acknowledge is that the solar and wind technologies are on these extraordinary exponential growth curves. So they, they're still, in spite of the various points that have been made, they're, they're still growing every single year by um, between 15 and 25 percent, which which means that they're actually doubling in size, therefore, uh, every two or three years, um, and 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 therefore clearly self-evidently there continues to be huge amounts of demand materializing all over the world, uh, and that's what's something that's always been continuously surprising forecasters in this area. Um, that that's one general observation. So I would suggest that the way to think about um, private capital and, and, and the role of private markets is that um, they're a little bit like water. They will flow to wherever the opportunities lie. And, and the role then of policymakers is to um, provide an environment to allow that water to flow, to remove the kind of dams stopping the flow of the water. And, and it's very different to 10 years ago. Um, you know, the, 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 the Milan quite correctly said that Eastern Europe, you know, sort of flashed and burned and so did many countries 10 years ago. But, but 10 years ago, you were still trying to push the water uphill because the economics didn't work. It's, it's, it's now actually very, very much, I was just easier for policymakers to um, put, put into place the necessary policies to allow and attract this capital. And the real challenge, and, and again, Climate Scope has pointed this out extremely clearly for, for countries like, um, uh, the difference between Africa and South America, for example. In South America, policymakers have, um, have been able to use development bank capital and policy to remove barriers to change and, um, and, and, uh, and, and significantly drive capital, capital into those markets, which means that you don't need so much public capital. So the ratio of public capital, it, it, the beginning is very, very high, but once you remove the barriers, it becomes much lower. And, and, and that has not yet sadly happened in, in, in large parts of Africa, but that's what now needs to happen in, in order for, for, for the capital to flow. Um, Gemma and Xavier, do you agree with that? The capital will flow uh, as soon as the um, economics makes sense. Uh, let me pose it, you know, slightly differently. You know, we are in the middle of this pandemic. Um, do you think, given every other priority that governments have in trying to attract capital um, it towards, you know, what they would think that you know would drive growth and jobs, um, that it might hinder or hamper this leapfrog in, in the electricity markets? Um, or for that matter, do you think capital will flow towards more peer-to-peer -peer trading, the way you were talking about, Gemma, um, where maybe the deal sizes might be just too small uh, to attract institutional investors? Uh, maybe uh, Xavier first and then Gemma? Um. I think it's good always to remove the barriers for capital to flow in the direction of the social interest, which now it's the transition. 
So mm -hmm. I don't I don't think there is anything wrong about it. What I think we could have problems is if we depend exclusively on this. So if we miss the goal, the ultimate goal, what is it? That few people and few corporations make profit with the transition or that we avoid the huge impacts from climate change and biodiversity loss of the current way of working of our energy system. Our ultimate driver, our ultimate goal is the second one. And allowing and aligning markets with achieving this goal is one tool, but not the only tool. And, and what I mean is that we, we should be careful not to lose the potential of the other ones. Let me put a very brief example about what I was insinuating before on the power market organizational structure. Power markets, as we have today, working on marginal prices, as we start deploying renewables that have very low operational maintenance and hence opportunity costs, will cannibalize themselves. So they cannot support these investments. These markets won't provide the signals for private investors because they won't be recovering. They don't have uh, an outlook for recovering this. The way of addressing this that we are proposing since already some time and discussing, because it's a, it's a discussion that has been lagging much behind. We are just advancing, putting renewables into the system, and we don't realize that the system itself is not able to handle these renewables. And the way forward we see, it's a splitting this organizational or this procurement, this organizational structure of this procurement into one that procures long-term, low-cost, renewable generation and another one that procures flexibility because they have completely different needs and they need completely different procurement structures. If we go to the one that procures long-term renewable electricity, we have two potential approach for this. And it's they are at the in the bottom line they are almost the same. We can put together a competitive approach like a PPA with auctions and let the private sector compete with, it, with this and introduce a lot of regulation on top of it to make sure that putting prices down does not compromise the ultimate goal, which is providing social value. But we can follow this liberalization way, let's say auctions with PPAs, or we can follow an almost equivalent point, uh, an equivalent way in terms of the impact it has for the capability to deploy these renewables, which is public ownership. I mean, imagine one country, I've been working in South Africa, but it could be any other country. You can put together an auction scheme for procuring renewables from IPPs uh, driven by profit, or you can have the government investing in these facilities to produce these renewables. And at the end of the day, the money from the government comes from taxes, so people are paying it, but the ownership is on a different side. And the signal to the promoter of the renewable, to the EPC contractor that is putting it or to the operator, it's the same. They have certainty that they will recover their costs. And you can reach, or you can provide this certainty either by a liberalized approach, like it's an auction, or either by a public ownership procurement program where you have a tending procedure, you have different EPC contractors competing, but the responsibility allocation is different. But you can reach the ultimate goal, which is making feasible that investors can put the resources needed for implementing this renewable capacity now, because they have certainty of recovering their costs along the time. So I think there needs to be a balance between both of them. And I get a kind of scared every time I hear that we go too much backwards to the past, to what happened before in the global north, which is an over-reliance on liberalization. And this has also risks associated to it, and we need to manage them with regulation. And then sometimes I find that we are forcing some countries to adopt what we have been doing in the global north, even without having it sorted out for the transition. And at the same time, hindering potential good pathways for developing the transition in these places. And at the end of the day, I, I really think both of them would converge. And that would be a mixture of private and public, both with adequate governance to make sure that both of them, the private and the public, they are working for the social value that it's expected to, to be provided from that. Gemma, uh, would, would there be this kind of regulation, balanced regulation approach to more peer-to-peer -peer distributed energy trading, or would you rather have a completely libertarian approach to this? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, there's parts of what Xavier just said that I agree with, but there are parts that I, I, I really disagree with. Um, I, I think his earlier comment around 
you know, it's not till you get 20 to 30% renewables in the system that it starts to really break. Um, but that is not, it's renewables that are pushed into the system via centralized planning. And um, I believe that like all grid failures are based on some kind of market failure. So if you can fix the market, you fix the grid. But I don't think that there's these just two dichotomies that Xavier pointed out, which is, you know, PPAs versus public ownership. I think that there is, uh, there are other ways to, to manage that. And the point he made about um, the, you know, the marginal cost, uh, you know, not providing a strong enough price signal to encourage the generation to come online. I, I don't agree with that because if you, if the market goes into negative, into contango, that is going to put a price signal to encourage um, storage uh, of various kinds to be put in the system and the emergence of flexibilities markets, which I, I agree with Xavier's point. So we've had like a wholesale market and consumers, and now we're emerging a local energy market uh, as a second layer and a flexibilities market as a third layer and the wholesale market becoming the fourth layer. And at, for countries that have a higher penetration of renewables in the system, the issue that they've got from centralised planning is the duck curve. And so you need markets that flatten the duck curve. And only when the duck curve is flat can renewables really make their mark. And only, you know, only then will ordinary citizens uh, and businesses uh, be solving energy problems rather than aggravating them. And uh, if we don't actually address the market, put the regulatory framework to create more dynamic markets and a flexibilities market by its very nature is a local nodal market. And so rather than having like these centralized price signals, we're gonna need dynamic nodal local uh, sort of price signals to really get the right um, outcome in the grid. Otherwise we'll have ever increasing amounts of renewables hoping for the best, uh, but discovering the worst. So I think that the big, you know, I think we need to solve this particular problem. And I think that the ultimate goal is a system that works for everyone. Uh, it's no good if we solve the climate goal, um, but you know, we have electricity that's unaffordable or an unstable system. So you, 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 you need a system that is low cost, stable and clean. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of people that think it's okay just to go to 100% renewables, but drive up the cost of electricity and have blackouts because the planet's burning. And I think that is like incredibly naive because electrification is what brings people out of poverty. So we can't just solve this one issue and just ignore it, drown everything out. I think that Northern Europe is not necessarily the model. There's aspects of it which can be drawn upon, but you know, a lot of the growth in renewables there was by incredible cost subsidies with centralized planning, which has driven up the, the cost of uh, energy overall. Um, and it's uh, the irony is that the cost, the levelized cost of renewable energy has gone down, and the cost of energy um, in high VI variable renewable energy markets has gone up. And we just we 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 ha we can't deny that. So there's something wrong with the centralized planning system, and we need something that is more dynamic. And not everything will be grid connected. There will be microgrids, and I think that that the price signal can encourage households and businesses to install distributed energy resources and it doesn't need money from the public purse. And that will encourage the emergence of networks um, that are really lean and, and efficient. So uh, I think there's many things that I think I agree with what Xavier is saying, but I don't believe in this dichotomy world of just you know PPA type market mechanisms or government ownership. I think that's the, I mean, of course, Kingsman and I have talked about one type of a double leapfrog of, you know, energy access and the shift to renewables. Uh, what you, uh, Gemma, you and uh, Xavier have been talking about is another type of double leapfrog, which is from not having any kind of power markets at all to having power markets of some kind and also having distributed power markets, um, which create that kind of network uh, approach. Uh, while making sure that it's also regulated enough that it's not a complete free for all. Um, there's a third set of questions that have now come up 
uh, especially from our audience. And I'm going to turn those to Milan. Uh, and I'll pose two questions to you, Milan. Uh, one is from Dr. Harsh Chaturvedi, who asks about the need for the human resource supply chain and the skilled capacity for this emerging energy sector. Um, from your experience in operating in many different parts of the world, you know, while again, while the cost economics might be making sense, is that workforce ready to build a different energy system? And uh, a separate, but I would say a related question from Marie Sibyl Conan is, are we paying attention to the unintended consequences of the energy transition and too much reliance on China for critical minerals and supply of solar panels? Again, something that Kingsman and I have brought out very clearly that the energy transition would perhaps get more political support if the value chains were also more um, distributed than concentrated. So this, the equipment and the workforce side of, of the transition, could you reflect on it as a developer, Milan? I think right now in 2021, uh, we have enough uh, uh, manpower to support uh, development of the industries. Um, it's uh, again, again, chicken and egg story. Um, it's where the markets are picking up um, to have, uh, you know, human resource development. Uh, but essentially, I personally receive uh, at least, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, but I receive at least 10 uh, CVs from people who want to switch industry uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, and um, right now there is, uh, there is uh, out there there is uh, experts in, in, the, in the overall, let's, let's call it the power industry, uh, including fossil, fossil fuels who are really eager to uh, to to join uh, to join the renewables, and that that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, now, to enable this transition, of course, uh, companies uh, will need to spend a little bit more on uh, you know education and, uh, and, and, and training and coaching. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, this is uh, this is a very very profitable investment. Uh, when done uh, properly, because we have uh, small countries where uh, human resources is, is not available. Uh, however, with the dynamics of the markets, uh, as I mentioned previously, um, our industry, especially solar, is creating a, a very small global village. Uh, and uh, we have expats uh, who jump from one country to another uh, in a couple of years uh, time frame, uh, simply because, uh, as I said, markets pick up and then they vanish. Um, so it's a, again, it's a very dynamic industry uh, and, uh, and human resource is not a constant value. Uh, sometimes it's in demand, uh, but uh, sooner or later it may become in excess. Okay, um, and, and your thoughts on the uh, value chain and the sourcing of the equipment is that is that a worry for emerging markets in which you operate? No, uh, the value chain now is uh, is uh, pretty much consolidated, more or less. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, leading uh, companies in uh, each of the uh, uh, value chain uh, levels. Uh, we do we do still see some. Uh, uh, actually significant uh, presence of Chinese players uh, uh, at least in the in the uh, yeah in the in the upstream uh, and downstream as well nowadays but more in the upstream more of the manufacturing uh, is taking place in China but I mean that's not a surprise for any industry I guess uh, but essentially the, 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 the market is quite globalized. Uh, there is no issues, no matter where you are based, there is no issues with supply chain, really. Great. Um, let me pose a, uh, a question to all of you, which has come from uh, uh, Xavier Pufos about the sort of technology determinism 
um, and whether we are getting trapped in just the solar and wind story and he's asking, you know, why are we not talking about geothermal, for instance? Uh, is that because there's a funding issue? Is that because there's a regulatory problem? Um, and of course, I'm taking this question and kind of expanding it. As we go through those multiple leapfrogs that, that many ways in which you can leapfrog that Kingsman talked about, is there, is there more momentum to be expected as we break into, um, I would say, renewables technologies that are still in the margins? Uh, or is there something unique about solar and wind that will just keep uh, accelerating their growth? Uh, maybe I'll start with Xavier and then I'll come to the, to the rest. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues, it's this focus or this obsession that we have in low prices. I mean, solar and wind, they have been able to advance fast in, the, in their learning curves and providing low prices, but not always associated to the value that they can provide to the power system itself and even to society. So I think that as we advance in the transition, we are going to be building on these first technologies. But this, the story was very different. I mean, just 20 years ago, I mean, PV was compared with CSP, for example, in, in, a, in a worse position by then. But then it has been managing its situation and has been able to reduce costs much faster. And now it's the driver of, of deploying capacity of renewables, but intermittent capacity. And for working a system that it's based only on renewables, we need something else. This something else can be storage, can be demand side response, but there are few technologies that have a completely renewable generation technologies that have a completely different generation profile and that can provide this kind of reliance on the system. So this kind of dispatchability, even if you want, when, when providing the overall or covering the overall demand. No? When we have done detailed analysis at country level, uh, Technology mixes, diverse technology mixes, so mixes on renewables that use many different technologies, they have it much easier to provide or to cover the demand at lower costs than monotechnologic mixes. Like, for example, let's say let's develop only PV. PV, developing only PV, it's okay until you reach certain penetrations, but beyond that, you need to count with other ones. So yes, I think the other technologies, renewable technologies that are still in the margins, they will have their chance to advance in their learning curves and provide the value they can to the power system. Because I mean, having very low cost of PV when you don't have demand, it does not provide value to the power system. And if there is another technology capable of providing this kilowatt hour or this megawatt hour that are needed in, in, in when you have the peak demand and it has a slightly higher cost, it will still be higher value that you get from the system and then it would become integrated into it. So there is room for all of them to contribute, yeah, and they should, in fact. Gemma, um, you know, if I could take an analogy from the automobile sector, um, the future of automobiles is not, you know, cars, it's actually computers. Uh, so in a similar way, are we, should we be talking about, you know, solar and wind versus geothermal or should we be talking about renewables versus the digital revolution that can transform electricity markets. Since you're at the forefront of that, I thought I'll, I'll give that twist to the question for you. Uh, well, I think firstly, we need to stop treating energy like it's cocoa beans. Uh, you know, it's, it it's, you know, behaves in a dramatic, you know, you, you can't just store it. Um, and then you've got renewable energy and then you've got variable renewable energy. Uh, and the purpose of a flexibilities market, the, the, the third layer that I mentioned, is really to get those variable renewable energies to behave in a way that is consistent with the demand profile of the grid at that particular time of the day. So it's how do you put a price signal to deal with excess solar um, and encourage load shifting? And how do you put a price signal to stop uh, like a voltage or reactive power issue in a particular uh, village or suburb um, so it's it's actually about trying to get something that is uh, very variable and well, it's somewhat predictable uh, forecastable um, but to have the, the system and the supply and demand organize itself around that so that people are more likely 
to, at a household level, charge electric vehicles or, um, you know, run pool pumps and how, you know, commercial and industrial activities would try and like maximize output when the price of electricity is super cheap or, um, you know, take that battery, that electricity from the grid and store it in a battery. That's literally what the flexibilities market, you know, is there to do to deal with that excess or, you know, or def deficiency in the grid at a particular time caused by variable renewable energy. Um, right. So I think firstly, we need to like start having a conversation. It's complicated, but you can't, you know, talk about it and think about like what the policies might be, uh, you know, without actually having that appreciation. Like you've got a market layer and then you've got like the physical grid and at the moment, they're, they're different things. So we need the market layer and the, the grid layer to be consistent with each other. You know, if you look at what, you know, renewable energy certificates, they, they can do great things in encouraging the installation of renewables. But if the certificates are not being purchased and consumed by users of power in that market, what they do is drive the uptake of renewables in a grid, not where it's needed and what's when it's needed. And that causes reverse flows of electricity and drives up the cost of power for everyone in that particular system. So mm -hmm. I think companies like Google are doing interesting work around 24 hour renewable power and trying yep. to buy energy and certificates matched against their load profile. Right. And I think a lot of the corporate sustainability leaders, you know, the RE 100s globally um, are starting to think about 24 hour renewable power, not just hundred percent renewable energy. Um, because they're inadvertently, you know, creating issues in, in grids. And a lot of the certificate programs were thinking about sustainable development goals as the gold standard for a certificate, but not actually requiring hourly intervals to be matched against load profile when people are buying certificates to be able to complain, claim that they're 100% renewable. So I think that we need to talk about that, um, these challenges and actually start to... Um, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter when you have a small penetration of renewables, like, t you know, 5 10%, but the, the problems start emerging with that way of operating once you get to the, the you know, double digits and, and above, which is where we want to get to. So you need to think about the system design and design it now. Otherwise, you end up having to do two system change, like, you know, regulatory changes to deal with the problems that you've created by a perverse policy a regulatory framework. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, throughout this conversation, we are talking about multiple different dimensions of leapfrogs on the technology side, on the finance side, on the regulatory side. Uh, but before I turn it over back to King's Mill, let me uh, get Milan once in, uh, once again in on this issue of uh, technology determinism. Uh, Milan, are you looking at deploying non-solar, non-wind, uh, renewables projects in the emerging markets you're operating in, or is that really the focus, at least for governments that uh, you are interacting with? Um, we might have lost him. Uh, we might have lost him. Uh, well, can, I, can I just add yes. um, one yeah. other thing? Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about energy, like, you know, renewable energy, but we don't talk a lot about the network piece and also the software layer. Because if you really want to create this sophisticated system, you know, where there's dynamic balancing, dynamic of energy, dynamic pricing of networks and all of that, there is a whole software layer that needs to emerge. Smart meters need to be put in place. So the issue of like non-payment of, you know, for energy in India, could be more readily dealt with it with the emergence of this sort of the technology piece. And that's really important because if you don't, you know, pay for the infrastructure, other people are paying for that in their, their bills as well. So I think that the, the software layer to encourage the right outcomes in the grid is really important to drive the behavior um, that's needed and also, um, yeah, be able to drive the penetration of renewables really, really high efficiently. It needs to be automated. If it's going to be manual, that's never going to happen. It, you know, I think we've got to be, we've got to be real about it. When you get to this very 
uh, you know, you know, very short response times for grid stabilization, and that's going to be driven not just from centralized sources, but distributed sources of battery storage and geothermal, perhaps. Then it needs to be a system that's highly automated, highly fine grained, and um, and I, I, you know, digitalized. My colleagues in uh, CW's power sector team have been deploying smart beaters in uh, small towns in India to get a better understanding of household uh, energy usage patterns, not in the kind of big cities, it's kind of how, the, how this you know, emerging uh, household electrification will uh, unfold. Uh, we better get a sense of you know, how people engage with this, with this new energy system. Um, well, so I think, I think what, you, what you've just said there is super important because if you've got lots of um, pumps and solar systems, you want to be able to think about how do you connect those in the most efficient way exactly. without putting exactly. oversized things in. So that fine-grained information from the smart meters is really important to right-size um, a microgrid for that community and to grow it in a modular way that's really scalable and, and sustainable. Absolutely. I mean, we've got multiple different teams one team working on cooling, one team working on electric vehicle charging, one team working on smart meters, another team working on the deployment of the business models to get, to get distributed energy going. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's ultimately these multiple leapfrogs that are happening that have to be also brought together in an efficient way. Uh, Kingswell, we're right on time towards the end of the program. So before I hand it over back to you for your closing remarks, and your thoughts, let me also dump uh, the remaining questions onto you. Um, my colleague Shekhar Hussain asked um, whether the civil society support for a constituent-led demand for clean energy can have a role in, uh, in these kind of covering for these basic development needs uh, for, for electricity and energy more broadly. Uh, and, and what, how could it drive it? And at the other end, you know, how could the how could multilateralism, especially you know the COP26 process that we're heading into, play an active role in enhancing this global uh, transition? Uh, similarly, Tony Goodchild has asked, to what ex what degree is it in Western governments' interest to subsidize the capital uh, for renewable energy in emerging markets? Um, not easy questions, but that's why I'm giving them to you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Aaron Abbott. And I think um, we have three minutes, yes, to, left to draw this to a conclusion. Is that right? Um, so if I may address those, those um, excellent points first, and then uh, maybe seek to summarize and, and draw together some of the disparate and interesting threads that have emerged in this discussion. So um, I, I think it's very very good point that civil society support is needed um, above all actually because you've got vested interests which are seeking to resist change and as we've seen in the tobacco industry before are basically lying to us about the consequences of change so you do need um, civil society support equally you do need a, a multilateral so, set of solutions I would suggest because um, you have solutions which are being found all over the world um, in, in, in India or um, in, in, in Germany, and, uh, and, and also, as, as Gemma pointed out, errors possibly in some of those countries which can be, from which learning can be derived and, and policy expertise can be uh, brought into uh, uh, other countries. Um, so then addressing this question about Western governments and should they be subsidizing renewables and emerging markets? Look, you've got to think about the numbers, right? You need hundreds of billions of dollars every single year to build out these renewable energy systems, which incidentally is not necessarily bigger than the amount of money you need for fossil fuels, but nevertheless, you need a lot of money. Um, so this, you're not going to get all that money from, from Western governments, but what you can get is you can get policy, uh, policy expertise and you can get technological expertise and they can kind of spark the change that is required. So I would suggest that the role of government, Western governments and developed market governments is to spark that change and to, 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 um, to, to give the technology and policy expertise in order to assist uh, these uh, emerging market governments to do uh, what will actually prove for them to be the right thing. Um, 
And then finally, um, if I may just draw together, I think some of the interesting threads and address some of the uh, points which have been raised. Somebody asked, what's different about um, solar and wind? What's different is very simple. They've got a very clear learning curve. Their costs fall every single year um, because they are granular, widely distributed technologies which can be applied, applied at scale anywhere. And, and as a result, you've got inventions happening all over the world uh, to drive costs down. And that's what's different about these technologies compared, for example, to fossil fuels, which don't have that. Um, then um, I think what's also for me really come out of this is how, um, how different emerging markets are to develop markets in this, if they're approaching this later. Um, and, and, and as Gemma says, you know, so many mistakes were made that don't have to be made again. And um, if you're building a system from scratch, you don't have to think about um, base load and massive um, uh, assets. You can think much more intelligently and you can apply digital technologies at a much earlier stage in that. As, as, as she says, um, means you end up with much cleaner, leaner solutions much, much more quickly. Um, then, then I think, as, as Abby has also pointed out, um, you don't need to have an ideological approach to this. You know, we, we should be taking whichever solutions work in whichever locations. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's going to be a combination of, of, of government and, and market. And um, you know, you just got to you just got to use whatever works. I would suggest. Um, and I, I, I think I'll conclude with. Possibly the, the key point we, we haven't possibly talked about enough, which is the digital solutions. Um, the, this whole renewable uh, shift is also a digital shift and that both makes it easier and means that we have many more solutions materializing all the time. Um, so thank you very much, Aaron. I hope I've given a very quick summary of, of, of some of the, the, the points that seem to me uh, particularly interesting in this. Indeed you have, and thank you so much, uh, Xavier Milan and uh, Gemma, and in his absence, uh, Kalikesh, uh, you really enriched this conversation. It's been a very rich debate. We've managed to get through a lot of questions, but clearly it demonstrates that um, Kingsman and I completely failed at uh, going anywhere beyond scratching the surface of this energy transition that we try to tackle. I think we, we were excited by the many different ways in which we were cutting and dicing the emerging world um, and trying to see where the political economy might lie. But what you've illustrated with your experience and your wisdom is that there are multiple leapfrogs happening. There is no one single solution. There is public, private, and regulation. There is distributed and grid connected. There is digital and the tangible. Um, and there is um, money and behavioral change all thrown in. Um, but that also demonstrates that there are so many more actors who could find it as part of their work lives to be constituents in not just consuming clean energy, but in uh, driving clean energy. And that's perhaps going to be the most important uh, factor in changing the political balance between uh, the energy system of the past and uh, the energy system of the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we will share this report with you in a couple of days and hope to engage with all of you uh, on another occasion. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.